But uh, so today uh, I have the pleasure then to introduce Didier Sonnet. Um, and the citation uh, which, for which he's giving the, the, the lecture is that Didier Sonnet has made very significant contributions to research and teaching at several interfaces between established geosciences and nascent complexity science over many years. That's one sentence which uh, unfortunately does very little justice to his, his extremely uh, diverse uh, and productive career. Um, maybe just mention that at the moment uh, he is the professor on the chair of entrepreneurial risks at the Department of Management Technology Economics at ETH Zurich. So you're wondering why we're inviting him to geophysics, uh, uh, giving him this honor. Well, it's because, of course, he's uh, very, for, very for since the 80s and continuing to this day involved in geophysics, uh, including the fact that he is professor of physics um, also at ETH, or associated with the Department of Physics. He's also professor of geophysics associated with the Department of Earth Sciences at ETH. And he also, I believe, has um, a, an adjunct professorship at UCLA in geophysics. So he's still very much a geophysicist. Um, maybe just to finish this with a very um, Part of the, the longer citation by uh, Nicholas Watson from our um, the Lorentz Committee who, who, who selected uh, DJ this year, he says that in, in my judgment, he's been a key player in the fundamentals of science of complexity and its applications to both natural and human worlds. He's one of the several, several pioneers of the idea of self-organized criticality in seismic systems has developed novel method of forecasting the onset of catastrophic disruptions in more general complex systems using log periodic oscillations. And his textbook, Critical Phenomena in Natural Sciences, developed during his period at UCLA, has become a standard reference. And, well, maybe I, we'll stop there because it goes on and on and on. And um, DJ said, please, just let me just get onto the science. Don't spend hours and hours. Uh, introducing me, but anyway, I would now like to just uh, call him up to the podium and present him with our, well, it has gold, it has gold lettering, this is the best, that, so anyway, um, congratulations for the Lawrence Lecture 2010. So I suppose that's my turn to speak. Thank you very much. So I, I put this list of, um, of affiliations not to impress in any way, but actually to impress the, a, a part of the community, which are the students. I want to teach students that science is multidisciplinary. And so one way of doing it is to show by show of example. I believe that more and more the challenges that we have to face require to break the walls of this um, specialization that is a curse of science nowadays, more and more given the, the challenge and the difficulties. And so um, I'm proud to, to, to try to show to the student that indeed they have to think broadly across disciplinaries. Um, so thank you very much for the citation. It's really an honor to be here. And what I'm going to try to do, to do is actually to destroy one of my old love. Um, the citation mentioned self-organized criticality. I'm going to discuss this um, uh, concepts, uh, which I call now Dragon Kings, uh, which I hope I show it's the black swans, which is more the self-organized critical concept or the power of concepts, and discuss uh, the application to a large variety of systems. So I'm going to walk with you through a series of examples and systems uh, going you know, from um, earthquakes, uh, you know, this uh, crust dynamics, to, let's say, engineering structures, to what is going on in our brain, epileptic seizures, or, and I go also to allude to important uh, aspect of the dynamics of financial markets. Because um, one reason why um, I've been so much interested in geophysics and earthquakes, of course, the complexity and the difficulty to get uh, 
an understanding of the many uh, aspects on this field. It's not just mechanics, it's uh, fluids, it's uh, um, chemistry, it's um, electromagnetism, it's many, many aspects, many, many scales. But I found over my career that um, social sciences, in particular the working of the financial system is even one order of magnitude more challenging. But even more, um, this is a tale uh, that wags the dog. Everything we do is controlled by finance, I've come to realize. The Great Depression, the Great Recession that we, have, we are living through. I'm going to give you a sense of how this um, view, I hope, I, I hope to give you a sense of how this view of um, connectivity between different disciplines allows us to get some understanding also on the big issues of where we are going, uh, economic-wise or financial-wise. So, let me start with the end, which is a description of how we can um, uh, summarize a lot of research in many, many fields. I start with uh, three examples here shown around the concept of oscillators. And here you see where is the, uh -huh, sorry. Um, I'm trying to get my mouse somewhere. Okay, so it doesn't appear. Where is the mouse? So you see on the uh, upper uh, left, the classical example of two, co two coupled oscillators, which are pendula. Um, and Wiggins uh, in the 17th century discovered this marvelous effect of the coupling between pendulum or between oscillators in general give rise to synchronization. And you see on the right the synchronization of five flies, this famous uh, example. And on the bottom uh, left you see partial synchronization that has been discovered uh, in several models of earthquakes, be they block spring models a la Burich Knopf or various examples of cellular automata or sandpile and so on where we start to understand that what is going on, the complexity is partial synchronization. So this phase diagram for me is the summary of maybe hundreds or if not thousands of papers um, combined together uh, both empirically and um, uh, theoretically into this understanding of the different regimes that we can um, uh, view, we can observe in different systems. And you see um, the, the complexity is simplified into axes, very simple. One is the horizontal axis, which is a measure of the diversity, the heterogeneity can be um, quantified in many ways in a system, and the vertical axis is the degree of interaction, coupling, and so on, uh, between the different constituting elements. And as um, you move around this di diagram, of course, if there is very little coupling and a lot of heterogeneity, you have basically what we see at the bottom, incurrent structures, um, while when you increase coupling progressively, you get to this uh, self-organized critical regime characterized by a lot of uh, dynamics, fluctuation at many scales, space, time, size, uh, probably often characterized in part over some domain of scales by power law distributions. And then when you increase further the coupling, you go to these um, runaways, these uh, um, synchronized events, catastrophic extreme risks, appearance of events of a great size which um, have of, uh, are of a different nature than the events occurring uh, in self-organized criticality. And in my um, partial classification, I would say that Earth, the Earth, the earthquakes function more in this regime, while the engineering structure functions in this regime. The stock market is also punctuated by these extreme events of a different nature. And probably the brain is a bit in between, I'm going to show you. There is a possibility to be able to uh, thank you. To uh, move, uh, move around this uh, fuzzy boundary between um, lack of predictability, which is characteristic of self organized criticality, and the larger degree of predictability that is characteristic of this synchronized behavior. So, that's basically the conclusion. So, let me now try to show you evidence and some uh, thoughts and some concepts, maybe a little bit of theory, of how we come up with this phase diagram. Um, and I'm start with what is supposed to be the common wisdom that in many, many systems, social, uh, natural sciences and so on, geophysics, geology and so on, all these uh, systems exhibit uh, fluctuations uh, at many, many scales. And I've just have these four slides with four panels on each slide uh, showing this very boring um, data, which is always a log-log plot, you know, so that a straight line qualifies a power law distribution 
character, characteristic of uh, scaling behavior, of the fact that the larger event is no more different than the rest of the population, except by its size, probably with the same generic um, uh, mechanism, uh, generating mechanism, from earthquake, rates of earthquake, so that's the size distribution of earthquakes, magnitude, which is proportional to the log of the energy, the distribution of the rates of seismic events in a given uh, area, the size distribution of debris orbiting around the Earth, or typical fragmentation processes, distribution of landslide, mountain collapse, and so on. We go to the distribution of forest fires, hurricane losses, solar flares, rain events. And then we shift to social sciences, where you see here the distribution of book sales, so success, blockbuster would be here, healthcare cost, um, terrorist intensity, size of wars. Richardson was one of the first uh, to document this and inspire Manbrot to develop his concept of fractals. Uh, cyber risks, uh, for example, in the distribution of size of events corresponding to identity theft, vulnerabilities in softwares, uh, YouTube success, as well as success in the Hollywood. So I could go on and on and suggest that indeed everything more or less is uh, characterized by power laws. Very boring. This is actually not what I believe exists, and I'm going to try to show you that there is life beyond power laws. Very important life, because it con concerns the possibility of understanding the greatest event that punctuates systems that are part of the organization of systems. So, but just to be sure that we are on the same page and we understand the reference of what is one standard way of understanding the generating mechanism for these power laws, let me remind you what is the concept of self-organized criticality. I'm using this uh, famous uh, picture um, that uh, pa uh, Bak Tang and Bisselfeld used to speak about this uh, cellular automata, the senpai analogy, where you pour sand one by one and progressively the slope increases until you reach the slope of marginal stability. And then the su uh, successive addition of grain size, so you drive the system uh, out of equilibrium by adding, here in this case, matter, grain size. You could do that with energy. You could do that with many other um, uh, fields in other systems. You reach a critical marginal um, instability of the system, and the response of the system when it reaches this um, out of equilibrium dynamical attractor is characterized by this broad range of scales, this power of distribution of avalanche size. And this has been, for example, one of the ideas for understanding the distribution of earthquake size, which led some, uh, for example, a team at UCLA in particular, uh, to propose that this was the reason for utter unpredictability of earthquakes. So I'm going to actually try to convince you that this is much beyond this view. Um, and for this, I, I'm going to present a lot of different data. Um, so of course, it would be necessarily superficial given the short amount of time to cover these many fields. And the, the first um, data, which is probably the most shocking, is of course provided by the present financial crisis. And so I'm going to move around you know, between natural sciences and social science very fast. And here I'm showing you um, the, the very shocking data, uh, which is summarizing the crisis that has been developing until 2007, uh, which is um, characterized by these three bars an almost invisible one here. Um, it's almost invisible, but it corresponds to a loss of a few hundred billion dollars. It's almost invisible because here the scales are in trillion dollars. So here, as you see, 30 trillion, 20, and 10 trillion. So these are the numbers that we have um, become accustomed to with the financial crisis. And this is just a loss that was directly uh, involved in this collateral, collateralized debt obligation. Um, um, uh, um, instruments uh, that led to cascade to a loss of global GBT as of the end of 2008 of the order of five trillion, five thousand billion dollar, which cascaded to a loss of almost 30 trillion dollar in the world market globally. And so, big question is, you know, how is it possible such a tiny perturbation give rise to this enormous effect? And this is actually an uh, extraordinary good padding for the Dragon King concept I'm going to show you. And one way of thinking about it is, suppose you have this plenty full of data that we don't have in many geophysical sciences, but here you have the record of over 50 years of data of, let's say, non-borrow reserve by banks, and you, you, you start, you have the luxury of trying to 
understand the fluctuation, the dynamics, and the strategy that is involved in here. And you start to build models and strategies to make decisions. And then suddenly, you have this cliff. And I, again, um, stress that the numbers here are, are orders of 100 of billion, okay, huge numbers. So that when you learn over 50 years, you are absolutely, absolutely unable to have any view of you know, this event, the catastrophe, the cataclysmic event that occurs and is totally outside the dynamics. Similarly, for many, many, I could show many, many graphs showing that you, know, you see nothing here, not because there is nothing, simply because you are using a scale that is commensurate with the abyss that we are seeing just suddenly appearing. There was a lot of fluctuation, a lot of interesting stuff, a lot of interesting statistics, but dwarfed by the enormity of the event. Similarly, almost nothing here on, let's say, the value of the so-called um, high-grade trenches, uh, which has, you know, this uh, collateral death obligation. Suddenly, enormous statistics. So, complete change of regime, enormous events, which are absolutely, um, we could call them outliers, very, very different. So, this is of the first little evidence that of the proposition that crises are not self-organized critical events, power distributed black swans, or my, as my friend Nassim Taleb um, described in his uh, famous book now, which is a kind of paradigm um, representation of financial crisis, but they are dragons. What, do, what does it mean? Well, if you think of the black swan story, and I will, of course, going, I'm going to uh, explain the story in many different fields. I'm, I'm just using the um, crisis as, um, as a startup, as a warming uh, thing. Um, Um, the story of this black swan, that there is a continuum of crises of all scales, which are or, of even size of all scales, which are of the same type, is that basically the extreme events are part of a continuum. They are basically unknown, even unknowable, until they, 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 they occur. A great earthquake, according to this view, is nothing but a small earthquake that doesn't stop, impossible to predict. There's nothing you can be diagnosing in advance, cannot be quantified, there's no predictability. In the case of financial crisis, there's no responsibility, the wrath of God. And uh, people can, like Ponce Pilate, wash their hands. There's only one unique strategy, only by insurance. And the only cause is that the real estate market in the US stopped growing, and we don't know why. And this gives rise to these enormous instabilities. In contrast, the Dragon King story is that most crises are endogenous. They are different from the rest of the population. There is a degree of diagnostic that can be performed in advance, can be quantified, there is a degree of predictability. And of course, when you apply that to the present crisis, there's a big consequences, a very important consequences that there is indeed sources like moral hazard, conflict of interest. There's a big importance of deregulations. There's a lot of responsibility and account accountability. And there is a consequent uh, strategic versus tactical strategies that come out of it. And this is an emphasis on weak global signals that give rise to some diagnostic. And you can see many evidence of weak signals that were preparing this crisis, like the doubling or tripling of banker salaries over the last 20 years, exactly in parallel to what happened in the 20s before the Great Depression, exactly like a remake of a movie uh, with the same type of uh, globalization same, same type of instability of the system. So let's now walk around seven different types of system. Or I'm not going to be able to go in details in all of them, of course, to suggest that the, there is empirical evidence for this claim that there is a um, population which is different from this power law that we tend to take for granted in many, many of these systems, often because we don't look carefully enough in the data. I'm going to draw two lessons on how we need to look with different tools, with different statistics, in order to actually see these great events, which is a kind of paradox, because you would say great events should be very visible, and should, you shouldn't you know, message the data or do something to see them. You actually have to. Let me show you the first one. The first one is the example of financial economics. I will go to um, city-side distribution, application to engineering, hydrodynamics, um, very general concept of optimization in complex systems, um, biology, and so on. So, um, first example is a question of whether 
the greatest instabilities in social system, the financial crisis, are indeed part of the same population um, as the standout, let's say, daily, weekly fluctuation that punctuate the market all the time. So this is a typical time series um, of returns of the Dow Jones Index over uh, about seven years of this, eight, seven years of data, where you see fluctuations and you see large deviations and so on. When you look at the distribution of these amplitudes, and here I see a very interesting data. I so exhibit a multifractal uh, signature because you have um, a continuum of distributions measured at different time scales. So here we look at the distribution of returns for this one at the time scale of months, and here uh, at the time scale of minutes, typically. And you see the typical um, diagnostic of multifractality in the distribution that can be actually um, predicted for multi by multifractal random work and so on. And you see nothing in the tail. You see that you know, the great events, both positive or negative, they are just appearing superficially as uh, you know, being part of the same population, as we would say, just by, let's say, characterizing or calibrating a model. This is simply because we are not looking at the data correctly. And what I mean by correctly is by looking at the underlying mechanism that produces this fluctuation. What is the underlying mechanism? It's the decision making of people um, looking at the risk they have to face, looking strategically at the risk return, the risk adjusted return they, they can hope for their portfolio allocation. And when they do that, they absolutely do not look at this. So this is a very important thing to um, be aware of when we do, we, we, you deal with social system is to think through the minds of decision makers. And the decision makers, what they worry about, all of us worry about, is speak to valley drops, drawdowns. We don't care about the daily fluctuation. We care about the fact that we may be unlucky buying at the top and seeing at the bottom. So now if you look at this statistic, this statistics is very different because it's a combination of the one-point statistics of the, let's say, daily returns plus dependences. So it's a very interesting object that is um, tuned to measure partial correlation, partial dependence, um, transient dependences that can occur in the system. If you look at the statistic of this object, you obtain something very different from what I showed you before. 99% of the data of this drawdown peak to valley can be explained by simple power law, things like that, but there are a few events in the tail that are distinctly dissimilar and that they occur maybe one, 10 times to 100 times more often than expected by the extrapolation. You could always argue that you could fit this or you could calibrate this with a, a better model that could interpolate, but you'll need a five, six parameter model where here two parameter model um, does the job of uh, fitting 99% of the data. There is no way you can fit these extreme events. You can actually look at many, many companies, data and so on, you see systematically this kind of elbow on the tail, you can do rigorous statistical tests and you find extremely small value for the hypothesis that the tail events belong to the same distribution. And so here it's a very interesting first lesson is that looking at statistics in a certain way make you miss completely what I call these dragons, these extreme events which are really different and we understand why they are different. They are, di they are different because they are occurring at the end of years of overheating bubbles that suddenly become unstable and make a cliff-like behavior occurring with positive feedback like a panic um, uh, dynamics that amplifies any fluctuations to start with. And you see we can completely meet them by cutting these um, big events in pieces by just looking at the daily data. First uh, very interesting lesson for looking at these great events. And this um, mechanism for this example is positive feedback. And this positive feedback is so important that I just want to spend one minute on it. In economic setup is exactly the opposite of a negative feedback. Negative feedback means that you have an equilibrium between price and quantity. As price goes up, demand should decrease like this, and you have the supply should increase, you have an equilibrium. Positive feedback means as price goes up, demand goes up. And therefore, the larger the price of the house, the more people are buying, and there is no end to this. There is no uh, restoring force. What does it give? Well, it gives the simplest equation I can imagine that captures that is to go beyond the simple proportional growth by assuming that the rate of return or rate of growth is itself growing, let's say, with the quantity, price, or population, or whatever the variable you are interested in. 
if the d is equal to 1 here, the solution of this equation is very simple. dpd dp dt equals p is an exponential growth. But as soon as d larger than 1, you get a monster. You get a finite time singularity. The solution of this very simple equation is a finite time singularity occurring at the critical time that is, whose value is determined by the boundary condition. That's what, why in um, mathematics we call that a, a movable singularity. And you have a determination of this TC from the initial price and the structure of the equation. This is how we think of um, the sum of the great events that can, can occur. And this actually, this positive feedback is an extremely good mechanism for explaining one um, very important uh, dynamics uh, for us, mankind, which is the population on this earth. This is 2,000 years of reconstruction by historian, and of course the data becomes uh, finer and finer of better quality in the last 200 years. You see here a log scale, linear scale. A straight line by construction qualifies an exponential growth. Uh, it would be the corresponding dynamic for the exponent d equals 1. Do you see a straight line? Well, population dynamics, what they try to do is they try to fit this data. By the way, the second line corresponds to GDP, which has been reconstructed also by historians. What they do is they try to fit by exponential, would be like fitting by a straight line, by local tangent. You need at least three or four exponentials, eight parameters at least to fit this model. While this model with two parameters does an extraordinarily good job. You have a, the positive feedback essence incorporated in these dynamics. The more people on the earth, the more niches we explore, the more creativity, the more invention, revolution of agriculture, medicine, and so on. So this is how we see these crashes coming up, coming up these dragon kings, as the resultant of the blow up of these bubbles that are due to this uh, positive feedback on the price. And this is not just the monsters uh, that can describe these finite time singularities, just these uh, financial um, events. This is my a partial list I found where evidence, either empirical and or theoretical, has appeared to suggest that the same type of monstrous dynamics of systems that do not exist forever, but the mathematical description blows up in finite time, doesn't mean that, of course, the system blows up in finite time. It means that you have a change of regime, like a phase transition, a bifurcation, a catastrophe, or a tipping point. You find them from planet formations, which are also associated with this side of dynamics to this um, ghost, uh, you know, Euler equation invested dynamics for turbulence, formation of black hole, the time domain, dynamics of plasma, rupture, metal failure can be seen of this uh, as a kind of finite time singularity, the transition from quasi static Rina Dietrich friction law to the dynamic behavior is a finite time singularity, the chemistry, the, di the dynamics of microorganism. Uh, coupled with positive feedback also uh, uh, give rise to finite time uh, coalescence of macroscopic bodies. You have this uh, instability of surface which give rise to DLA, different limited irrigation, and many, many other spikes like lightning and so on, which can be also modeled in this way. Even the prosaic problem of the coin settling on the uh, floor when you l uh, lose it is going to settle in finite time after an infinite number of collision. Uh, this is called the famous Euler uh, problem, as well as uh, stock markets. And probably we have many, many other examples. So this um, first insight in the mechanism for these extreme events, which are of a different kind, let me now use that and go on uh, discussing other examples. One dramatic example of this is the deviation from Zipp's law. I discussed power laws. Zipp's law, you know, is uh, this um, law, this claim uh, that emerged um, after the um, edition uh, in 1949 by a sociologist named Zips, who noticed that the frequency of words in languages, in texts, in the Bible, whatever, in your thesis, you know, your book um, follows this remarkable regularity of being the frequencies inversely to. Um, um, so the number of words which have a given frequency of occurrence in a given text is inversely proportional to, um, to, the, to this frequency. So this works also for firm size, for city size, for number of genera um, in biological, uh, number of species per genera for, uh, in biology and so on. And so basically it's a power law with an exponent one. This works remarkably well for the distribution of cities. And of course this emerged through 
a mechanism of proper growth, and we think we start to understand very well this uh, ZIPS law. Now, when you look at the data, let's say for France or for uh, UK, you find these often reported data. Here I'm, I'm showing a ZIPS law, which is a kind of inverted survival distribution. And you see that all the cities very finally align along this red line, which is just an incarnation of the ZIPS law in a slightly different uh, format. But there's one guy here, one guy, which is absolutely away from the distribution. That when you see in papers, in books, which are referring to the power laws and ZIPS law and so on, it's kind of uh, hidden. So basically, it's shown the reverse. So it's hidden, and there's a kind of fuzziness there. You don't discuss it. It's the little secret. This is Paris. For uh, UK, it's London. Now, I'm asking you, you want to know France, you want to enjoy France, you want to enjoy and understand the geopolitical formation and evolution of uh, UK. Do you throw away London? Do you throw away Paris in order to understand the dynamics of the system? No. The point is that there is a special mechanisms at work that have led to the growth of the cities as they are, and we, and we start to understand, of course, where they come from. Um, Recently, I'm happy, I mean, this is an extremely difficult problem a priori because you want to develop a little test that allows you to detect one event as an anomaly. It looks very convincing just on this graph, but you could say, yeah, what can we do, you know, as a scientist, speak about one event? I mean, usually if you want to, um, you know, detect a deviation in the tail, um, you would need 10, 20, I mean, that would be the minimum, minimum with the best technique you can imagine. I'm happy to report that, and this is a paper that is a working paper. We have invented a new methodology just one, last week, so I'm happy to report it as really fresh, that allows to test rigorously for the existence of one anomaly in the tail of the system. And it works very well, and we have very small p-values for the annual hypothesis that Paris is belonging to the same distribution as the rest of the cities of France or London and so on. So this is a, a second example suggesting that indeed these dragon kings, these um, special events do exist. Why do I call them dragon kings, by the way? Well, simply because when you look at the distribution of um, wealth of people uh, in different countries, you have the Pareto law. Pareto, law, Pareto found, among many other things, that uh, in the late uh, 19th century, that the distribution of wealth of income was distributed according to a power law. But you have certain countries where you have a king or family, special importance, which is of this kind of outlier. So we call it a few years ago the king effect. And uh, last year I had the pleasure to visit um, China and I thought that uh, adding some additional layer, dragons, uh, to stress the fact that uh, you know, we deal with animals of a very different kind could really uh, um, capture the idea that uh, in one way they are related to these dragon kings, but they are very, very different. different. So dragon and king emphasize this idea. Let's speak of a third example. Failure and rupture of materials. Uh, be they the crust, probably, or, but actually in the laboratory you can have much better control, of course. And here is a typical type of experiments when you can measure the slow damage occurring in different pieces of material the more it urges the system, the more singing it tells you. This is the energy of acoustic emission, tiny earthquake that you can measure in the lab as you stress the system more and more. And this has models suggesting what is going on. Each tiny crack, micro crack, will release a micro earthquake that you can record on the, on the system. And when you look at the distributive size of these events, you see a typical log log in many decades well, maybe some curvature, there's some defects, finite size effect, but basically a large, broad distribution of size, also closely approximated with the power law. Is this the only story? Absolutely not. Because when you listen to the system, you hear this system singing at it reveals its progressive damage. But then, bam, the system breaks. And the incipient rupture is of a league of itself. Um, it is a kind of correlated percolation where suddenly you have, among all the cluster of damage, a guy which is outside the statistics. Actually, in percolation theory, by the way, you don't count the uh, percolating cluster as part of the statistics. It's a, indeed the Dragon King. It's an outlier. Another example, hydrodynamics. 
And this is maybe my, um, personally, my, my um, example that I like the best uh, because I had a, a difficult time to convince my colleagues that it could be true that indeed there were these extreme events that play such a big role in organizing the systems and they were belonging to, they are belonging to different uh, a kind of their own. This is an example that came out of discussion that I had for many months with Itamar, Professor Itamar Prokacha in Israel, very well known among physicists working in turbulence in particular. He was also a co-inventor of um, multifractality in 1995, uh, 1985. And when I organized this um, conference way back, 2000, I presented, started to, to discuss a bit this idea that there might be, there was a burgeoning of this idea, there might be some events that could be deviating from the power of description. And that was at the end of June 2000. And I was surprised in August 2000 to receive an email from him, from Itama Pokacha, with a draft paper attached to it, um, telling me, Didier, you see, I have, uh huh, interesting. Um, uh huh. Okay. Um, I have, um, thought about your proposition and I can show you you're wrong. And he said, you see, in order to be, in his typical style, in, in order to be precise, I've worked with an exactly solvable model, which is called a shell model of turbulence. And we have solved it and we show that in the previous graph, which for some reason of compatibility with the system here doesn't show up, we're showing the distribution of velocity increments over a relatively short time series, showing what was appearing to be um, if you can imagine, some distribution here and a tail, um, which looks different. And he said, you see, it looks different, but when I increase the statistics for velocity fluctuations, so the PDF of velocity fluctuations at different scales, they are called shells in this model, when you push the statistics 100 times more, we have the luxury of doing that because it's computer computer model, you see that was appearing different is just a continuum. There's no Dragon King, there's no outlier, there's nothing, it's just uh, um, bad statistics, DDA. Really? So I was a bit shaken, so I looked at the paper in great details, I read it, and I sent him a two page email saying, Thank you, Itamar, you have proven my case. And a great scientist of Excalibur missed this. So it's a second lesson that I'm teaching to my students on how to look at data in order to reveal this monitor that you know, even the best trained scientists can miss. What was the problem here? The problem was that a Dragon King is not necessarily, as I've shown before, seen as a deviation in the tail, you know, this uh, Paris effect and thing, thing like that. It may be revealed by the way the PDF, the distribution may scale, may scale at different, at different um, scales in this, scale, in this case. So here you see the distribution at different shells, so correspond to different level of course grading of the equations. And what you find is you can do this trick, what we call collapse, by uh, scaling the ordinate and the abscissa so that basically you have extracted the common uh, dimensional um, analysis of this. And you can do that for the small fluctuations. You can do that for the large fluctuations, not, bo not both at the same time. This suggests that the two populations of large or small are different. Is it true? Actually, you can solve exactly what you find in this model, that indeed, in this model of turbulence, you have coexistence of two types of fluctuations. Incoherent or close to incorrect fluctuation that correspond to this distribution here, and solitary waves, soliton structure that propagate across scales, not in space, but across scales, which are very, very organized and give rise to this tail. So you can actually see them with your eyes. You completely meet them if you just look, look at the distribution of size of the fluctuation to one scale. So this is another trick that you have to keep in mind in order to be able to detect this. And here this is a nice example because you have um, evidence directly from the solitary structure. Another example, metastable state in random media. Many, many applications. In physics, this is a problem which is known as the configuration of the random directed polymer in uh, zero temperature. It's, uh, called, it's supposed to be um, a baby model for spinning glasses, you know, these big challenges of dealing with statistical physics of um, heterogeneous quench um, disordered media. Uh, we actually, uh, some years ago, we have found, we have developed an earthquake model where we showed that 
these are the fault structure on which the system of earthquake dynamically organized onto. So we have a kind of self-organized criticality of the system of earthquakes in this system, but also a very interesting hierarchy of structure. I mean, actually, it's also um, a problem of optimization, a pure mathematical problem of optimization, let's say, in math or in computer science. And let me present it in this way here. Suppose you have a system here, which is, you know, uh, discrete. And I'm not representing uh, this, but you imagine a um, square like Manhattan array of lengths, of bounds, or of uh, highway elements. And on each of these highway, so you have like uh, 4,000 times 1,200 elements, bonds on this um, highway structure. And on each of these bonds, you have a random number, which is chosen once for all. It's quench disorder, frozen disorder. And you can imagine that this number is like the toll that you have to pay when you drive across this segment. And the idea is, what is the best path to go from, let's say, one point here to exactly its opposite on the other side, which minimize the cost along this path? Um, I mentioned random directed polymer because you can think of these numbers as the energy of absorption of the monomer in contact with the substrate, and there are many, many other applications, as I said. Now, if you solve the problem, it, can be, it was considered to be an NP-complete problem. It now actually has been understood to be solvable by a polynomial transfer matrix techniques. And this is a solution where you see all the optimal paths for all the possible starting point and the corresponding ending point. The beauty, and you see here when you magnify four times, you see a kind of hierarchical structure. You have absolutely nothing, white noise numbers, quench. You ask a question of optimization, you see this beautiful structure emerging. And the faults actually are selected by the dynamics of earthquake, but that's another story. Now, the point is that you can play a game here and say, well, I can define, if I play the bad physicist, I can define a, a game of defining avalanches, which correspond blowing up the present um, uh, cartoon, saying, OK, let's look at the optimal path that goes from this point to the opposite point. And then I'm going to move to pull the, this path by one unit and ask, what is the size of the avalanche? So the, what is the, the burst of the reconfiguration of this path just moving a little bit the, to ending point by one unit? And the color area here, the gray area, Aha, it's dead, yeah, I'm taking too long. Um, correspond to the size of the sweeping of each move. So you can look at this as a kind of avalanche distribution, and then you can look at the side distribution. You can actually solve this problem in two dimensions exactly. And you find that the distribution is a parallel with, ah, okay, coming back, uh, with an exponent which is uh, calculable, exactly, calcul uh, computation, com uh, computable exactly, two, two fifths. But you find something else, that coexisting with this power law, we have these bumps, and you find that there are two scaling regimes here. The size, anti so this is uh, data for different system size. This is a trick that you often do in order to um, um, check scaling these systems of different widths from you know, very narrow to much uh, broader here, 512. And what you find is that there are two scales, and this is this inset showing that one scale of this avalanche scale with a power 4 over 3 corresponding to the maximum size of, uh, at, at which the power law, um, until which the power law holds. And you have another scale which corresponds to this bump, which scales, and you can show that exactly, because it's exactly soluble, with another exponent as a function of the width of the system. You have, in, so you can rescale in different ways, you have here the coexistence of two families, a power law distribution and a family of extreme events of dragon kings. What are they? Intuitively, very clear. You can see that you have a family of neighbors, so it means that, and you have big jump like this correspond to a complete reorganization of the optimization of the, of the optimal systems when you move further. So this is another nice example on which you have a complete control of the problem with many applications. Last example I want to discuss in some detail because it's maybe the most illuminating and we have been playing a lot with it with very surprising quantitative analogies with earthquakes. We have an, are now a paper published with the title Epileptic Seizures, the Quakes of the Brains. I was called to co collaborate with one of the leading teams working in the world working with epileptic seizures three, two years and a half ago. And they uh, started to have this extraordinary database recording patients for several weeks 
with electrodes planted in the, in the, in the brain, literally in contact with um, the soft matter, and putting this patient for weeks under this uh, monitoring, you know, which is quality of data you can never hope to have um, in normal situation. And so I jumped on the opportunity to play with this data with them, and we came up with this insight that, okay, what is going, so this is a collaboration with Professor Osorio's group is Kansas University, and we found remarkable analogies with not only, so you see each of these graphs correspond to uh, different types of statistics that are typically recorded for seismology, earthquakes, for landslides, for other stuff. You see the Guillermo Richter law here, distribute seizure energies and earthquakes. Same exact power law exponent. The only thing different, of course, is the size of the system. You have many, many more decades, of course, in the crust than in the brain. You have the inverse Omeri law, the direct Omeri law here. You have the distribution of event waiting time, which has been very fashionable in the last few years for earthquakes. Uh, you have many, many statistics which are comparable in the two systems. So is it it? Is it just Paolo? Or are there dragon kings? Well, this is for humans. You can actually, not, you cannot play too much with humans, but you can play with rats and with rabbits and you can make them suffer from epileptic seizure, I'm sorry to say, by um, injecting convulsant substances. And what you see, at the same time, the statistic, which is the distributed seizure, seizures on the upper left, the inverse Omeri, direct Omeri law for foreshock and aftershock, the distribution of waiting time and so on, develop these characteristic scales you know, in all the statistics. And this corresponds to the regime where indeed characteristic events appear in the system. You couple the different excitatory uh, events, the neurons or the, the group of neurons, to a degree where you go to a different regime where rather than having this uh, scale-free power of distribution I was showing, you have this characteristic dragon king that appear. Now I can come back to this phase diagram I showed you at the beginning, where we had this coexistence of, uh, let's say, power self-organized critical generated to the synchronized regime where extreme events of enormous proportion, the Dragon Kings appear. So this was the data for humans, as I showed before. This is uh, on the upper left for rats. You could make the prediction that if you remove, you lower the dose of convulsants on rats, you should be able to cross this boundary from the synchronized upper uh, left regime to the lower right regime and going back to self-organized criticality and destroy the Dragon King regime. And this is indeed what you obtain because you can do that in laboratory and you find the power of distribution of, of, of seizure size. You could also imagine that humans, some humans, suffer from seizures with much more, um, let's say, coupling in the brain, so to speak. So you should be able to observe also for humans so that was showing just that some rats do under lower level of convulsant light in this regime, but you could also predict that some humans would be on this side, depending on their pathology, and you do find this very clear elbow uh, characterizing a characteristic scale emerging in this system. So these are some of the examples that I've encountered in my career and, uh, you know, chasing or hunting for these Dragon Kings. Uh, by the way, I should say that uh, on the main newspapers of Zurich, uh, just last year, there was a, a journalist who coined this uh, title, speaking of my work, the Dragon Hunter in German. So you can imagine the pleasure of my sons uh, seeing their father being a Dragon Hunter. So you see science can lead to um, quite interesting um, adventures still. So what are the mechanisms uh, behind these Dragon Kings? I think there are many. In the same way that um, you know, my book, Critical Phenomena in Natural Sciences, has two chapters documenting many, many mechanisms for power laws, uh, including self-organized criticality, which is, which is not a theory, it's a concept. There are many mechanisms underlying self-organized criticality. You have, I think, several mechanisms, of course, underlying the generation of these Dragon Kings. I just briefly mentioned and I already outlined briefly the relationship with correlated percolation with this incipient infinite cluster, 
you can actually develop many models in these directions. Rupture phenomena are part of this. Another uh, type of um, mechanism, which I also alluded to already, it is partial synchronization. Um, and another one that we have discovered recently is a beautiful analogy with uh, Bose-Einstein condensation. So I think my time is uh, short, right? Two minutes and five for questions. Okay, good. Okay, so I'm not going to show you the theory, then I'm just um, jumping to the consequence in terms of predictions, just in two minutes. Okay. Um, once you have realized that there are such events of such moment, mo momentum, momentous size, it begs the question, of course, to understand where they come from, and then to ask if they are indeed of a different generating mechanism, is it possible to actually use this difference to diagnose them? And this has been a large part of my efforts in the last five, ten years, with uh, several applications, of course, epileptic seizures, a big challenge. We are still continuing on the earthquake challenge, and of course, financial crashes, systemic instabilities. I just want to show you two ideas. One is that we are using constantly in this challenge, which is to divide to conquer. Dividing to conquer by using this kind of idea of a renormalization group, like looking at the system at many scales and trying to understand the dynamics, the description of the equation as a function of scale. Another fundamental idea is to use this final reduction theorem, which is the idea that close to bifurcation, a transition that is, let's say, associated with the Dragon King, there is a fundamental reduction of complexity into simple normal forms. For example, for one codimension one um, transition, you have only and only 18 types of bifurcations, of which about half of them uh, are associated with, with a second order phase transition, namely exhibit critical precursors. And so the idea is to understand, to, not to try to predict the system all the time, but to identify pockets of predictability where there is this condensation of complexity. And this again applies to many of these systems and we have applied it to many systems, including financial crash. So, yeah. Thank you. And um, so not uh, taking too much time on the question, I would say now, I would say the most visible application nowadays is the initi is initiative that uh, we launched uh, two years ago at ETH Zurich, we call it the Financial Crisis Observatory, um, which basically addressed this question of, so it, we released already several um, outlets of prediction made in real time with information released release in a scientific manner, identifying this um, exuberance in stock market. And the, to finish, this will be my last slide, the challenge is fundamentally to address the issue of can we do something before the resumption of the severity of the crisis that we see. Basically, this slide makes the point that since 2008 with Lehman Brothers collapse, nothing has been like before. And contrary to everything you can read in the press or what the government tried to make you believe or the banks, all evidence shows that, the, for example, this is a measure of Eurozone, the central bank's um, action uh, acting on the sensitivity of, or the fragility of the banks, the situation is even worse now than it was two or three years ago. By many measures, including the size of the credit bubble, you see is up there, compared to what the extreme uh, event was in the 20s or 30s, giving rise to the Great Depression. So we need quantitative measure of these great events. So this is summarized by this diagram. And I hope you have uh, taken something out of this um, quest for a multidisciplinary, I would say even better, a transdisciplinary approach, where we learn constantly by crossing the barriers. And uh, I would say the key, key message is, uh, I hope to convince you that it's worthwhile to ask ourselves our, the question in our modeling effort and in our data analysis to look for Dragon Kings. Um, and one great prize is a degree of predictability, I believe. Thank you very much. We have time for some questions. Yes, uh, Dave, please use the microphones. Uh, yes, please use the microphones. Okay. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, you talked about predictability and uh, 
uh, in the probabilistic sense, and that's not really forecasting. So if you want to forecast, after you find the Dragon Kings and you want to forecast, you need to know a little bit of the dynamics. And uh, what we find in space physics is if we know what drives it, we have a good handle on how to make the prediction or the forecasting. So in, are there mechanisms that can be used for understanding the dynamics so that you can make forecasts? So um, a mechanism that we find often in action, let's say for obviously earthquakes, uh, um, the expert here will recognize that um, a model which is probably the, the best, one of the best candidate workhorse for short-term predictability is called the Oaks self-excited um, um, ETAS model, which basically say that earthquake excite all the earthquakes. We have evidence that, uh, you know, earthquake beget earthquakes. We have evidence that the same occurs in the brain because it's a self-excitation medium. So we have a class of processes uh, extended to multivite domain to um, addition of uh, exogenous stochasticity and so on, but basically based on self-excitation. That would be one class that we um, play with for this predictability. Another class is... Um, Positive feedback. I mean, positive is a very generic phenomenon, but you can, depending on the system, um, write down concrete equations that you can calibrate. They are partially deterministic with stochastic terms, of course, also very important. And combine them, that with um, different procedures, you obtain a degree of predictability. For example, the stuff that we do for financial predictability exactly use calibration of um, probabilistic equations, stochastic equations that you cal calibrate on the data and one unknown is the critical time of the end of the bubble which is the time when the crash is the most probable. Uh, we can play with this type of approach also for many of these dragon kings when they are associated with the bifurcation. Other questions? Other questions? Maybe I could there's no other question, maybe I'll have a, a short one, which is that, uh, in a way, uh, Didier, whoops. Didier is, is the, the Dragon King, as far as I can see, is an outlier to an outlier because the power laws, and not, you know, in the last 20 years, uh, nonlinear geophysics, we've been explaining to our colleagues that what they think is an outlier is really a power law distribution because they think a normal distribution is a Gaussian and if it's not Gaussian it's an outlier so something different we've been explaining power law is all you need so you don't have an outlier then and now he's talking about outliers from what we consider outliers so maybe this will be mm, quite difficult to really establish I mean I'm, I think some of your examples are convincing but perhaps some uh, less so but anyway very interesting That's not a question. That's not a question. So yeah, it's just a call for a challenging problem. Uh, I mean, the, the, the point is that we should not ignore these events, which are even individual, because they puncture the system. I and mean, I've come up with understanding that this is so important to understand the global dynamics. One event can make a whole different Paris, London. Just take this example, which is the most dramatic. Others, we have full control theoretically and so on. Of course, the case of earthquake, landslide, and so on is much more controversial. Uh, and I don't claim that we have proven that in any way. But it asks questions. It's, it, it casts the problem in a way of revisiting the question in particular in a combination of statistical and a mechanistic, dynamical uh, approach. Okay, we're going to have to thank our speaker again. Because